Hey guys, today's video lecture topic is going to be chemical reactions and enzymes. As always, please make sure you're filling out your notes organizer as you watch the video, being sure to answer every question so that you can use your notes on the homework check. So before we start, let's just review a couple of things that should be familiar to you, starting with the difference between a physical change and a chemical change. When you have a physical change, it's simply a change in the state of matter. There is no change to the atomic or molecular makeup of whatever it is that you're dealing with. In a chemical change, you do have a change in the actual atomic makeup. Atoms are being rearranged when bonds are being made or broken, okay? The, the different molecules are going to different forms of molecules in a chemical change. So a classic go-to example of a physical change is going to be, you know, water turning into ice or ice melting back into water. It's still H2O no matter what form it's in. It's only a change in the state of matter, okay? There's no change to the molecular makeup. It's two hydrogens and an oxygen. Now, on the other hand, when you have hydrogen peroxide becoming molecules of water, that is a change in the atoms. The atoms are being rearranged. Okay, it's, it's still hydrogens and oxygens, but you're changing one form of molecule into different form of molecule, so that would be a chemical change. So here I have a list of some changes, and I want you to pause on this slide for a second and answer your question number two. Identify these as either physical changes or chemical changes. Okay, so pause, complete your number two, and then I'll show you the answers here in just a second. All right, let's see how you did. So the crushing of a can would be an example of a physical change. The material that makes up the can is still the same. Um, generally speaking, a physical change is something that could be reversed. So you could like uncrush a can and make it look almost exactly like it did before. Um, so a chemical change typically cannot be reversed without another chemical change. Iron rustings, this is called oxidation, when it's exposed to the oxygen in the air, that's an example of a chemical change. Um, so you have pure iron, Fe, becoming FeO2, okay? It's being oxidized, so the atoms are being rearranged. Solid ice cube melting to liquid water, again, that's your classic example of a physical change. The combustion of fireworks as they explode. Anytime you have combustion or burning of something, that's going to cause a rearranging of atoms, which is an example of a chemical change. Okay, so now that we've talked about chemical versus physical change, we're going to focus on chemical reactions, chemical changes. Chemical reactions are represented with what we call chemical equations. You've seen chemical equations before, I'm sure. There are parts of a chemical equation, they are written very specifically. On the left side of an arrow in a chemical equation, you have what's called the reactants, the, the starting materials, the things that are reacting in the reaction. Then you have the arrow sign, which will often be called the yield, and that represents the transformation, the reaction process. And then on the right side of the arrow, you have the products, the materials being produced as a result of the reaction. So here we have the chemical equation for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide and water coming in, okay, so those would be our reactants. They react together with energy from the sun in order to form, so we have yields, our transformation taking place, glucose and oxygen. So glucose and oxygen would be the products. Let's make sure you really understand this. Here's another equation for you. So now we have glucose and oxygen coming in and carbon dioxide and water and energy being made. So it's the opposite of the reaction we just looked at. So in this equation, glucose and oxygen are our reactants, the things that we are starting with that are reacting. In this equation, carbon dioxide and water and energy are our products, the things that are being produced or made. And now critical thinking time, what reaction is this? If it is the opposite of photosynthesis, do you remember what that is? This is the chemical equation for cellular respiration. So we can use what's called an energy diagram to illustrate the energy transformation that takes place during a chemical reaction. Energy diagrams have very specific parts to them. So this part right here is go are going to be your reactants, what you start with. This part right here are going to be your products. Now remember, we're looking at the change in energy, right? So you can see the, re the energy of the reactants is way up here, the energy of the products is way down here. That's going to be really important in a second. In this energy diagram, we have our reactants over here where the energy is really low. We have our products over here where the energy is really high. This little blip of energy, okay, here it's pretty small, but here it's pretty big, that is called the activation energy. All reactions, whether they release energy or whether they absorb energy, all reactions take a little bit of energy to get started. That is called the activation energy, the energy required for a reaction to start or activate. 
Um, there are two types of reactions, and you just saw their diagrams there. They're called endothermic reactions and exothermic reactions. When bonds are formed or when bonds are broken uh, during chemical reactions, that's going to take the absorption or the release of energy. Okay, so it takes, you know, energy to, to make bonds. It releases energy to break bonds. When the overall reaction absorbs energy, you call it an endothermic reaction. Okay, energy is being taken into endo into the reaction. Um, when the overall energy of the reaction is being released or exiting the reaction, you call it an exothermic reaction. Now in an endothermic reaction, it's absorbing that energy from the surroundings. So if this was taking place in a test tube, it's taking that heat energy from the test tube to make the reaction happen. So it's actually going to make the test tube or the beaker feel cold. In an exothermic reaction, it's releasing that energy in the form of heat out into the surroundings. So if this was taking place in a test tube or a beaker, it would feel very hot. So like fire, that's a chemical reaction taking place that releases heat energy, which is why fires feel hot. They're exothermic reactions. So again, here are the energy diagrams for endothermic and exothermic reactions. So you're going to need to pause on this slide so that you can draw these for number seven and number eight. Okay, so you're going to want to make sure you label each axis, so energy on the y-axis, the reaction taking place on the x-axis. You have the reactants over here, the products over here, and then the activation energy. Now, since the reactants start with such a high amount of energy, and then they end with just a tiny little bit of energy, think about what's happening there. Energy must have been released. You end up with less than what you started with. So energy must have been let go, right? So that's, this is an exothermic reaction. In this reaction, the reactant's energy is way down here, but yet the products are much higher. So the energy has gone up, which means energy must have been absorbed, which means energy has come into the reaction. It is an endothermic reaction. So pause on this if you still need to draw and label your energy diagrams, and then answer those questions off to the right there. So now that we've talked about chemical reactions, we can't talk about chemical reactions without talking about these special proteins called enzymes. Enzymes are what we call a catalyst, and more specifically, a biological catalyst. A catalyst is anything that speeds something up. So a biological catalyst are catalysts, so they speed up something um, in living organisms. And what do they speed up? They speed up the efficiency of chemical reactions. So enzymes are special proteins that do two things. They make reactions happen faster, so they speed them up, and they lower the activation energy. So they make reactions happen faster, and they make them happen with less energy, which as a living thing, that's awesome, right? You have chemical reactions taking place inside of you all the time. So if enzymes make them happen faster and with less energy, that's gonna benefit you, the living organism. Here are some examples of some reactions that are taking place inside of living organisms that utilize enzymes. Digestion, cell division, photosynthesis, making more DNA. Even in your saliva, you have enzymes that are being used to uh, break down materials, break down your food. Cell regulation, okay, using checkpoints in the cell to make sure things are going well. All of these use enzymes. If you didn't have enzymes in your body, it would take you so long to digest your food that you wouldn't be able to survive. Now, a couple of things that enzymes do not. Enzymes do not increase the amount of product that's being made, right? You're just rearranging atoms. You can't make more product. Um, they just make it happen faster. They also don't get used up, which is awesome. They can keep getting used over and over and over again. So here is an energy diagram that shows how an enzyme does two things. It makes reactions happen faster and with less energy. So make sure on your diagram that you draw two graphs, one showing the reaction taking place without the enzyme, this would be the red graph here, and then one taking place with the enzyme. So remember, enzymes do two things. They make reactions happen faster. You can see that here. The blue line starts, you know, the reaction starts faster. Um, than the red line without the enzyme. And then they make it happen with less energy. Look at the activation energy here with the enzyme. Just a little bit needed, right? Without the enzyme, you need all this energy for the reaction to take place. So enzymes are awesome. So pause on that if you still need to label and draw your energy diagram for number 12. Okay, now enzymes. Remember we've been using the phrase structure determines function. Structure determines functions. Enzymes are proteins, right? They have specific structures. And it's the structure of the enzyme that determines the function of the enzyme. So enzymes are shape specific. They only work with certain reactions. You can't just take any enzyme and throw it in any reaction and expect it's gonna speed it up. Okay, this is sometimes known as the lock and key model because 
a specific key fits with a specific lock, right? I cannot take the key to my Yukon and go over there to a Ferrari because that's the car that I want to have and try to use my Yukon key to start the Ferrari, right? Keys and locks are shape specific, just like enzymes are to their reactions. And it's the structure, the shape of that enzyme that determines its function. Okay, so here's um, what an enzyme looks like and what I mean by saying that it's shape specific. Enzymes fit with what we call their substrates, okay, the things that they react with, the reactants. They fit with their reactants in the same way that locks fit with keys, okay, almost like little puzzle pieces, right? You can't just take any atoms and think that it's going to fit with this enzyme. It's only going to work with certain reactions because it's shape specific. So here's a couple of vocab terms for you. The substrate is the thing that's being acted upon by the enzyme. So here would be our substrate. The place where those two things join, the substrate and the enzyme, is called the active site. So this orange little blob here would be the enzyme. This would be our substrate or our reactants. They join together to make the reaction happen quickly and then find your, make your final product, Okay, the materials that are being made. So here's another one. Note that the shape of this enzyme is different than the shape of this enzyme. So the substrates are different, right? Enzymes are shape specific. They only work with certain substrates. They only work in certain reactions. So again, I'm going to say this a million times. The structure of an enzyme determines its function. So what happens then if I change the structure of an enzyme? This is known as what we call denaturation. Okay, a denatured protein or enzyme is one whose shape has been changed. If you change the shape of the enzyme, you change its function. That's going to be really important with a lab that we look at later this week. So how can I denature an enzyme? What can change the shape of a protein or of an enzyme? A couple of ways that you can denature enzymes or change their shapes. Extreme pH, okay, acids, bases. Um, heat, cooking, for example, radiation, using really strong chemicals like um, chloroform, for example, can denature an enzyme. So take a look at this graph here. This shows you that this enzyme works best at this specific temperature. If you change that temperature, if you make it too hot or too cold, you're going to denature the enzyme, change the shape of the enzyme, which means it can no longer function. This structure determines the function. Enzymes work best under what we call an optimum pH. So these are three different enzymes, pepsin, amylase, and arginase. And if you look, the pHs that they work best are quite different. So pepsin works best at, an, at a pH of 2 in a very acidic environment. Okay, amylase works at like more like a neutral environment. So let's talk about pH for a second. If enzymes work best at a certain pH and I can change their shape by giving them an extreme pH, what is pH? pH is a measurement of hydrogen ions in a solution. Okay, what's a solution? A solution is a liquid mixture that's made up of two parts, the solute and the solvent. The solute is the substance in the solution that is being dissolved. The solvent is the substance in the solution that is doing the dissolving. Water is often called what, what we say the universal solvent because it can dissolve so many things. Okay, so the solute is the solution being dissolved. The solvent is the substance in the solution doing the dissolving. Water is the universal solvent. So in a solution, if it has a pH of less than 7, it is what we call an acid because it releases those hydrogen ions when dissolved in water. If a, if a solution has a pH of greater than 7, it's what we call a base because when it's put in water, it's going to release hydroxide ions. Okay, so in the middle, right at 7, is what we call neutral. So take a minute, pause on this slide to pick a couple of these things to label on your pH scale there. Now, let's talk about water for a second. Water has a neutral pH, which is just one of the properties which make it so useful to living things. Some of the other properties that make water useful, okay, so first of all, it's pH is 7, and think about how much of your body is made up of water. So why do we care about the properties of water? Because so much of every organism is water. So it has a neutral pH, which is good because most processes in living things take place around a neutral pH, and most of you is water. Water is what we call a polar molecule. It means that it has an overall charge, which makes it great for bonding. It also means that, that it can dissolve a lot of substances, and it's why it is the universal solvent. Water is both adhesive and cohesive. Adhesion is water's ability to bond with other molecules that aren't water. 
Cohesion is water's ability to bond with itself. Okay, this is uh, this makes the bonds, remember water can form bonds really easily. Um, those are called hydrogen bonds, which are easily broken and also easily made. Okay, so adhesion and cohesion. This is going to be useful to living things. We'll talk about this more. Um, but this is why water forms a dome. This is why water is able to travel up and down plants and up and, and throughout roots. Okay, but adhesion and cohesion. All right, that's it for today. I hope you're having a wonderful day.